Prefaces to the Bondage of the Will This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. De Servo Arbitrio On the Enslaved Will or The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther Translated by Henry Cole Preface by Henry Atherton Minister of Grove Chapel Camberwell, S.E., and General Secretary of the Sovereign Grace Union. This excellent work of that eminent servant of God, Martin Luther, one of the noble reformers, is acknowledged to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of Luther's productions. Luther himself considered it his best publication. I had purposed writing a short account of each of the opponents, Erasmus and Luther, who come before us in the book, and of the controversy, but from lack of time owing to many calls, and wishing to get the volume into the hands of lovers of Luther as soon as possible, I had to forego this privilege. I believe I have succeeded in producing the best English edition of this masterpiece of Luther that has been published. Cole's translation has been used with slight alterations from Vaughan. My task has been a difficult one, especially as I am ignorant of the German language. Luther's scriptural quotations are, of course, in the German tongue, and as he often seemed to quote them from memory, and as no references to verses, and sometimes none to chapters are given, and sometimes the wrong name of the book is given, English concordances have been of very little help to me, and often no use at all. Yet I trust this edition will prove a success in spite of my handicaps. Although Luther used certain words that I should not employ, yet I have adhered faithfully to his own phraseology as translated by Cole. Luther speaks for himself. This book is most needful at the present day. The teachings of many so-called Protestants are more in accordance with the dogmas of the Papists or the ideas of Erasmus than with the principles of the Reformers. They are more in harmony with the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent than with many Protestant or Reformed confessions of faith. If the Lord should be pleased to open the eyes and understanding of some of these so-called Protestants to whom I have referred, through the perusal of this work of the great reformer, Luther, enabling them to see that they are at present believing and teaching awful delusions contrary to the word of God, and the Protestant reformed religion, and causing them to return to the old paths, the labors of the Sovereign Grace Union will not have been in vain. The labor involved in the preparation of this work for publication in its present form has been enjoyable, although it has often been carried out in much pain, and sometimes during sleepless nights. I rejoice in being able to issue it, and do earnestly pray that the Lord will bless it to the ingathering of His elect, and to the maintenance of His cause and truth, in the days in which our lot has been cast. Grove Chapel Parsonage, Camberwell Grove, S.E.S. June, 1931. Preface by the Translator The translator has long had it in meditation to present the British Church with an English version of a choice selection from the works of that great reformer, Martin Luther, and in November last he issued proposals for such a publication. He considers it, however, necessary to state that this treatise on the bondage of the will formed no part of his design when those proposals were sent forth. But, receiving subsequently an application from several friends to undertake the present translation, he was induced not only to accede to their request, but also to acquiesce in the propriety of their suggestion that this work should precede those mentioned in the proposals. The unqualified encomium bestowed upon it by a divine so eminent as the late Reverend Augustus Montague Toplady, who considered it a masterpiece of polemical composition, had justly impressed the minds of those friends with a correct idea of the value of the treatise, and it was their earnest desire that the plain sentiments and forcible arguments of Luther upon the important subject which it contained should be presented to the Church unembellished by any superfluous ornament, and unaltered from the original, except as to their appearance in an English version. In short, they wished to see a correct and faithful translation of Luther on the bondage of the will, without note or comment. In this wish, 
the translator fully concurred, and having received and accepted the application, he sat down to the work immediately, which was on Monday, December 23, 1822. As it respects the character of the version itself, the translator, after much consideration of the eminence of his author as a standard authority in the Church of God, and the importance of deviating from the original text in any shape whatever, at last decided upon translating according to the following principle, to which it is his design strictly to adhere in every future translation with which he may present the public. To deliver faithfully the mind of Luther, retaining literally as much of his own wording, phraseology, and expression as could be admitted into the English version. With what degree of fidelity he has adhered to this principle in the present work, the public are left to decide. The addition of the following few remarks shall suffice for observation. 1. The work is translated from Melanchthon's edition, which he published immediately after Luther's death. 2. The division heads of the treatise, which are not distinctively expressed in the original, are so expressed in the translation to facilitate the reader's view of the whole work and all its parts. The heads are these. Introduction, Preface, Exordium, Discussion, Part the First, Part the Second, Part the Third, and Conclusion. 3. The subdividing sections of the matter, which in the original are distinguished by a very large capital at the commencement, are, in the translation, for typographical reasons, distinguished by sections 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. 4. The quotations from the diatribe are, in the translation, preceded and followed by a dash and inverted commas. But with this distinction, where Erasmus's own words are quoted in the original, the commas are double, but single, where the substance of his sentiments only is quoted. The reader will observe, however, that this distinction was not adopted till after the first three sheets were printed, which will account for all the quotations in those sheets being preceded and followed by double commas, though it is presumed there will be no difficulty in discovering which are Erasmus's own words, and which are his sentiments in substance only. 5. The portions of Scripture adduced by Luther are in some instances translated from his own words, and not given according to our English version. This particular was attended to in those few places where Luther's reading varies a little from our version as being more consistent with a correct translation of the author, but not with any view to favor the introduction of innovative and diverse readings of the Word of God. With these few and brief preliminary observations, the translator presents this profound treatise of the immortal Luther on the bondage of the will to the public, and he trusts he has a sincere desire that his own labor may prove to be in every respect a faithful translation and that the work itself may be found under the divine blessing to be an invaluable acquisition to the church, a sharp threshing instrument having teeth, for the exposure of subtlety and error, a banner in defense of the truth, and a means of edification and establishment to all those who are willing to come to the light to have their deeds made manifest, and to be taught according to the oracles of God. Henry Cole, London, March. 1823. End of the Prefaces. Introduction. Martin Luther, to the Venerable Dr. Erasmus of Rotterdam, wishing grace and peace in Christ. That I have been so long answering your diatribe on free will, Venerable Erasmus, has happened contrary to the expectation of all, and contrary to my own custom also. For hitherto I have not only appeared to embrace willingly opportunities of this kind for writing, but even to seek them of my own accord. Someone may, perhaps, wonder at this new and unusual thing, this forbearance or fear in Luther, who could not be roused up by so many boasting taunts and letters of adversaries congratulating Erasmus on his victory, and singing to him the song of triumph, what that Maccabee, that obstinate asserter, then has at last found an antagonist, a match for him, against whom he dares not open his mouth. 
but so far from accusing them, I myself openly concede that to you, which I never did to anyone before, that you not only by far surpass me in the powers of eloquence and in genius, which we all concede to you as your desert, and the more so, as I am but a barbarian, and do all things barbarously, but that you have damped my spirit and impetus, and rendered me languid before the battle, and that by two means. First, by art, because, that is, you conduct this discussion with a most specious and uniform modesty, by which you have met and prevented me from being incensed against you. And next, because on so great a subject you say nothing but what has been said before. Therefore you say less about, and attribute more unto free will, than the sophists have hitherto said and attributed, of which I shall speak more fully hereafter. So that it seems to me even superfluous to reply to these your arguments, which have been indeed often refuted by me, but trodden down and trampled under foot by the incontrovertible book of Philip Melanchthon concerning theological questions, a book, in my judgment, worthy not only of being immortalized, but of being included in the ecclesiastical canon, in comparison of which your book is, in my estimation, so mean and vile, that I greatly feel for you for having defiled your most beautiful and ingenious language with such vile trash. And I feel an indignation against the matter also, that such unworthy stuff should be borne about in ornaments of eloquence so rare, which is as if rubbish or dung should be carried in vessels of gold and silver. And this you yourself seem to have felt, who were so unwilling to undertake this work of writing, because your conscience told you that you would of necessity have to try the point with all the powers of eloquence, and that after all, you would not be able so to blind me by your colouring, but that I should, having torn off the deceptions of language, discover the real dregs beneath. For although I am rude in speech, yet by the grace of God I am not rude in understanding. And with Paul I dare arrogate to myself understanding, and with confidence derogate it from you, although I willingly and deservedly arrogate eloquence and genius to you, and derogate it from myself. Wherefore I thought thus, If there be any who have not drank more deeply into, and more firmly held my doctrines, which are supported by such weighty scriptures, than to be moved by these light and trivial arguments of Erasmus, though so highly ornamented, they are not worthy of being healed by my answer. Because for such men nothing could be spoken or written of enough, even though it should be in many thousands of volumes a thousand times repeated. For it is as if one should plough the seashore, and sow seed in the sand, or attempt to fill a cask full of holes with water. For as to those who have drank into the teaching of the Spirit in my books, to them enough and abundance has been administered, and they at once contemn your writings. But as to those who read without the Spirit, it is no wonder if they be driven to and fro like a reed with every wind. To such God would not have said enough, even if all his creatures should be converted into tongues. Therefore it would perhaps have been wisdom to have left these offended at your book, along with those who glory in you, and decree to you the triumph. Hence it was not from a multitude of engagements, nor from the difficulty of the undertaking, nor from the greatness of your eloquence, nor from a fear of yourself, but from mere irksomeness, indignation, and contempt, or, so to speak, from my judgment of your diatribe, that my impetus to your answer was damped, not to observe in the meantime that, being ever like yourself, you take the most diligent care to be on every occasion slippery and pliant of speech, and while you wish to appear to assert nothing, and yet, at the same time, to assert something more cautious than Ulysses, you seem to be steering your course between Scylla and Charybdis. To meet men of such sort, what, I would ask, can be brought forward or composed, unless any one knew how to catch Proteus himself? But what I may be able to do in this matter, and what profit your art will be to you, I will, Christ cooperating with me, hereafter show. 
This my reply to you, therefore, is not wholly without cause. My brethren in Christ press me to it, setting before me the expectation of all, seeing that the authority of Erasmus is not to be despised, and the truth of the Christian doctrine is endangered in the hearts of many. And indeed I felt a persuasion in my own mind that my silence would not be altogether right, and that I was deceived by the prudence or malice of the flesh, and not sufficiently mindful of my office, in which I am a debtor both to the wise and to the unwise, and especially since I was called to it by the entreaties of so many brethren. For although our cause is such that it requires more than the external teacher, and besides him that planteth and him that watereth outwardly has need of the Spirit of God to give the increase, and, as a living teacher, to teach us inwardly living things, all which I was led to consider. Yet, since that Spirit is free, and bloweth not where we will, but where he willeth, it was needful to observe that rule of Paul, be instant in season and out of season. Second Timothy 4, two. For we know not at what hour the Lord cometh, be it, therefore, that those who have not yet felt the teaching of the Spirit in my writings have been overthrown by that diatribe. Perhaps their hour was not yet come. And who knows but that God may even condescend to visit you, my friend Erasmus, by me his poor weak vessel, and that I may, which from my heart I desire of the Father of mercies through Jesus Christ our Lord, come unto you by this book in a happy hour, and gain over a dearest brother. For although you think and write wrong concerning free will, yet no small thanks are due unto you from me, and that you have rendered my own sentiments far more strongly confirmed, from my seeing the cause of free will handled by all the powers of such and so great talents, and, so far from being bettered, left worse than it was before, which leaves an evident proof that free will is a downright lie and that, like the woman in the gospel, the more it is taken in hand by physicians, the worse it is made. Therefore the greater thanks will be rendered to you by me, if you by me gain more information, as I have gained by you more confirmation. But each is the gift of God, and not the work of our own endeavors. Wherefore prayer must be made unto God, that he would open the mouth in me and the heart in you, and in all, that he would be the teacher in the midst of us, who may in us speak and hear. But from you, my friend Erasmus, suffer me to obtain the grant of this request, that, as I in these matters bear with your ignorance, so you in return would bear with my want of eloquent utterance. God giveth not all things to each, nor can we each do all things, or, as Paul saith, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12.4 It remains, therefore, that these gifts render a mutual service, that the one with his gift sustain the burden and what is lacking in the other. So shall we fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6.2 End of the Introduction